So I'm starting the sermon research this past week. And as usual, I'm just, you know, trying to get something started. And I Google Jacob's well. Now, you would think a place that is central to the story of the Gospel of John, the, the a, a moment we're talking about today, the woman at the well, happens at Jacob's well. You would think that I'm going to get a biblical picture, right? Uh, you know, a lot of desert, maybe, you know, a pile of rocks or something. But I'm going to get something. But if you Google Jacob's well, you don't get the biblical site. You get this. You get a swimming hole south of Austin, Texas. <laughs> ah, this thing is called Jacob's Well, and it is a spring-fed cave with really, really cold water. And, of course, it is really hot in Texas, so people like to go and jump in this well. What they don't tell you is this well is very, very deep. And because it is very deep, it is very dangerous. And people have jumped into the wells, tried to find the bottom, gotten confused, turned around in some of the rooms or caves that shoot off of the bottom of this cave, and drowned. Never made it back to the top. You see, that's what the world does to you. It will tell you, oh, this place is just as good. This place is the same thing. And they'll never tell you how dangerous it is. And you'll jump in. And you'll never make it back to the top. Like the woman who talked to Jesus at the real Jacob's well. John chapter 4. Stand with me in honor of God's word. So when Jesus had learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself wasn't baptizing anybody, but his disciples were. He left Judea, and he went again to Galilee. Now, he had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came out to draw water. Give me to drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask water from me, uh, for, for me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews did not associate with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket. And this well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks, from this, who drinks this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and I won't have to come here to draw. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it. Believe it and live. Let's pray together. We know who she is. It may not be a well, it may be a chair in the office, it may be a table in our school, but we know who she is. We know where she'll be. So we pray that when this moment comes, we will be as fearless and as bold in talking to her as you were at the well. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Jesus had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. 
In fact, he would have actually been discouraged from going through Samaria. Samaria is that place across the tracks, you know, that place where they live. Uh, it's that place that you don't ever want to go to, and even when you go to there because you have to, it gives you the heebie-jeebies. Okay, you know what the heebie-jeebies are? It's that, it's that thing where your skin crawls, like you got stuff, and you just, you know. I asked my dad one time, I said, what are the heebie-jeebies? He said, you know, when you get all the heebie-jeebies, that's the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> But you've been there, haven't you? You, do, you, 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 you? you talk to somebody, you've been somewhere, the conversation is over, and you just want to go take a shower. That was Samaria. In fact, if you walked across Samaria as a good Jew, then you had to take a bath, wash your clothes, lest you take some of the dirt from Samaria on into Galilee, on into Judea. But Jesus had to go there. Why? Because this woman was praying. Now, we don't have any record of her prayer, but we know her prayer. Why? Because Jesus came. You know, sometimes you pray and you don't know you're praying. You've prayed those prayers, haven't you? Sometimes the prayer is, oh God, I just can't make it through another day. Or sometimes the prayer is so deep and so painful that you can't say it out loud, but it is heard just the same. And this woman was going down for the, oh, fifth time. And Jesus met her. He begins the conversation with a scandalous request from, for water. Why do you want something of me, she said. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. Our people don't have anything to do with each other. He asked because he was thirsty. Jews get thirsty. Samaritans get thirsty. One of the things they had in common was that it was hot. It was the desert, and both of them were thirsty. They needed one. You know, we live in a culture that wants to tell you that you are so unique, there's nobody else like you in the world, and that is partially true. But now you have to keep defining your individuality uh, by, by some kind of label. The, you're this group, that group. Whether or not you have a tattoo, the color of your hair, uh, the way you part your hair. Do you keep your hair natural? Do you use some kind of treat, a product on it? On and on the list goes so that you can tell the world I'm totally unique and there's nobody else like me. You just let me do me. And we're finding out that is one of the loneliest places in the world to be. One of the things that's interesting in our conversations with our friends at Mount Zion, it's not how much we're discovering about the difference, but how much we're discovering that's the same. Same problems. Same dreams, same hopes, same worries. We have that common humanity. And Jesus begins his conversation by establishing a point of commonness. We have this in common. We're both human. We're both thirsty. Let the conversation begin there. How are you going to get water? You didn't even bring a bucket. And the water is deep. The well is deep. The water's a long way. How are you going to get this? If you knew who it was, Jesus said, you'd ask from me. She didn't know who it was. Not till later. But Jesus knew who she was. And you do too. Have you ever wondered why the biblical writers ne never named the characters? You would have thought that somebody this significant in the life of Jesus, this story of the woman at the well, this story that we have been telling for thousands of years, you would have thought that somebody would have gone back to that little town 
and found out who this woman was. The town's not that big. Even now, if you're on a Holy Land tour and you go to Jacob's Well, you'll get on the bus at your hotel, you'll drive and drive and drive and drive and drive and drive, you'll get off the bus in the middle of nowhere, your guide will go, this is Jacob's Well. We'll get back on the bus and go back to your hotel. There's no reason to stay. There's nothing to do. It is nowhere. It couldn't be that hard to go to that little town and say, hey, do you guys know who this woman was? Somebody was probably kin to her. But he leaves it open. Most time in the story of Jesus is a man walks up, a woman walks up. We're never given a name. Why? Because John wants you to name this person. You know who she is, don't you? You know her name. You know where she'll be. She's that friend of yours that is always making the wrong decision. She has the Midas touch of failure. And she'll call you tomorrow and she'll talk about how great life is. She's got a new job. She's got a new boyfriend. She's got a new thing she's trying out. And this is going to make everything different. And you set your watch. In three months, she'll be calling you. She hates all men. They're all liars and dogs. No, this job didn't work out either. I don't know why I can't get it together. She knows her failures. She just don't want you to bring them up. You know who she is. You know who he is. He's that super successful guy in your corporation who's gone to the top. Who walks through with an air of confidence that he has it all together, but you know if you were to blow too hard, you would blow over his whole house of cards. Because, see, somewhere back, he had a choice. There was a great opportunity, a great moment. This promotion would make all the difference. He would finally get to the level of success and money and, and recognition that he had finally earned. This was his moment, but as he wrote down the list of pros and cons, he realized what it would do to his family, what it would do to his marriage if he took this next job, but he took it anyway. And he paid the price. Now, do you think he's going to come to you and tell you that, hey, I made a mistake. Don't make the same mistakes I did. No, uh-uh. It's too late. He can't say he's been wrong his whole life. He just can't face that. So what he does is he doubles down. He makes his failure a badge of honor. And he lectures you when he can that unless you're willing to pay the same price he paid, you're not ever going to be successful in this corporation either. You know who he is, don't you? So are you going to say anything? It would seem to me it would just be the friendly thing to do. Are you going to say anything? You know, if the two of you were talking and he said, hey, you know, I think I hurt my elbow. I think my shoulder's wearing out. Uh, my back is killing me. You would say, hey, I, I know a good doctor. I know a good clinic. You need to talk to these people. They will help you out. It would ju it's just the friendly thing to do. If the guy was to say, hey, I, I'm coming up on a, a great anniversary and I really want to take my wife somewhere special, you would go, oh, I know just the place. It's the friendly thing to do. We help each other out. But when you hear that sigh that lets you know everything is not as good as they're telling you it is, when you know that there's an opening where you can say something, Will you say anything to your friend? 
Now, now I know. The world is telling us it is very arrogant for you to share your faith. It is, it is, uh, it is wrong to say that you have the truth and nobody else does. And, and for you to impose that on somebody else, well, well, Mike, that's just not right. And, and you're right, imposing it on somebody else isn't right. Listen, I, I, have, I have had those evangelism Gestapo training sessions. Okay, you've been to them, I've been to them, we were taught how to evangelize, we were given a couple of tools, whatever it was, and at the end of that conversation, somebody was coming to Jesus. If we had to hit him in the head with a chair, somebody was coming to Jesus. You've had those, right? They don't work. They don't work. Never have. Here's what does work. It's when you can honestly say, this is what I know. This is where I was. This is what happened to me. Here is what I know about Jesus. Jesus promised that woman that life would become like a spring within her that just overflowed, that just... Have you, ever, have you ever seen a spring like that? They call them artesian wells. Uh, they, they just explode out of the ground. And we don't know where they come from. We don't know uh, how long they'll last. They're, they're almost impossible to cap. Uh, but they just run water all the time. You ever seen anybody? You ever seen that? That's what Jesus said your life is going to be like. Have you ever known anybody who's like that? They're aggravating, aren't they? Hmm. Uh, that person that no matter how life bumps them, no matter what goes on, they're always smiling, always joyful, always grateful, always generous. You see, the problem isn't that we don't say anything. The real problem is we don't have anything to say. You see, Jesus has promised us, our rabbi is alive. Our rabbi has promised us, if you will open his word and sit, sit still, if you'll go to the class with him, he will teach you just like he taught the 12. And when he begins to teach you about who you are and what his plans are for you, about all he's doing in the world around you, then that becomes this, this flood, this, this spring that keeps running and running and running and never runs out. If you knew that to be true in your own life. Now listen, I, I know, in fact, I, there, there are articles out today about how everybody's leaving church and Christianity's not going to be able to make it in the postmodern, post whatever world and all that. And, and all the negative press is not true. But they'll quote certain numbers and say Christianity won't survive. Hear me. If there was ever a time for you and me to be confident of the truth the veracity of Christianity, it is now. It has been tested. It has been beat up. It has been thrown out, thrown in jail, crucified, attacked. And the people who keep attacking are always frustrated because they can't get Christians to give up their Bibles. We know it's true. It's been proven again and again and again. But do you know it? See, it's not that we don't say anything. It's that most of us don't have anything to say. So tomorrow when you sit down at the well, now it may be an office chair, it may be a table in your classroom, it may be the street out in front of your mailbox, but you know who she is, you know who she is. When she shows up, when he shows up, are you going to say anything? If you have something to say, you'll say something. Let's pray together. 
with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm not going to do anything to put you on the spot. I don't want to embarrass you, you know. I don't like doing that. But I tell you, I want you thinking about your own life in this moment. You know who she is. You know who he is. So begin to pray right now that the Lord will turn the conversation, will guide the moment, and when that moment happens, you'll know what to say. Jesus promised when the word is, is demanded of you, don't worry about what you will say, for the Spirit himself will give you words to speak. Perhaps it's time to become part of this church fellowship. We'd welcome you. Our friends, our counselors, our pastors at a sign, at a table with a big sign that says next steps. They're waiting on you. Help you get that process started. Or maybe. Maybe when you heard me starting reading the story of the woman at the well, you said, that's me. Going down all of the world's wells. barely making it back up. Those sins that cause you such anxiety, Christ died for. You don't know that debt anymore. His resurrection gives you an opportunity for a life of purpose and hope, a life you've been dreaming of, and it's yours for the asking. It's his gift to you. Now, I know I'm saying a whole lot, just a handful of words, but our counselors, our pastors, out at a table waiting for you right now. I beg you, do not go home the same way that you came. You do not have to. He's waiting for you where you are. The church waits for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. We pray now the choice we make is exactly what you